Good evening. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reform Presbyterian Church as we come together for our evening time of uh, worship. And tonight we're going to be looking at the 13th chapter of the book of Joshua. Now, when we've come to these uh, long chapters in the book of Joshua that have uh, you know, a long section for us, it's been our practice not to read all the way through all 33 verses, but to take it section by section, and that's exactly what we'll do tonight. But before we uh, get to the Word, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have guided us again this evening into your Word, and we pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you will continue to strengthen us through the teaching of Holy Scripture, that we might again learn more about what it means to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, if you're turning with me there in your copies of God's Word to the 13th chapter of Joshua, we're going to be reading the first of 14 verses as we open here in the Old Testament. Again, so we're going to start there, Joshua chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Now Joshua was old, advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, You are old, advanced in years, and there remains very much land yet to be possessed. This is the land that yet remains. All the territory of the Philistines and all that of the Geshurites from Sehor, which is east of Egypt, as far as the border of Ekron, northward, which is counted as Canaanite. The five lords of the Philistines, the Gazites, the Ashtodites, the Ashkelonites, the Gittites, the Ekronites, also the Avites from the south, all the land of the Canaanites and Mira that belongs to the Sidonians, as far as Aphek, to the border of the Amorites, the land of the Gebelites, and all Lebanon toward the sunrise, from Baal Gad, below Mount Ermon, as far as the entrance to Hamath, all the inhabitants in the mountains from Lebanon, as far as the brook Misrephoth, and all the Sidonians, them I will drive out before the children of Israel, only divide it by lot to Israel as an inheritance, as I have commanded you. Now therefore divide this land as an inheritance for the nine tribes and half the tribe of Manasseh. For the other half tribe, the Reubenites and the Gadites, received the inheritance which Moses had given them. Beyond the Jordan eastward, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had given them from Aror, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, and the town that is in the midst of the ravine, and all the plain of Medeba, as far as Debon, all the cities of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, as far as the border of the children of Ammon, Gilead, and the border of the Geshurites and Machathites, all Mount Ermon, and all Bashan as far as Salka, all the kingdom of Og and Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth and Edrai, who remained in the remnant of the giants, for Moses had defeated and cast out these. Nevertheless, the children of Israel did not drive out the Geshurites and the Machathites, for the Geshurites and Machathites dwell among the Israelites until this day. Only to the tribe of Levi he had given no inheritance. The sacrifice of the Lord God of Israel, made by fire, are the inheritance, as he said to them. Amen. Now, as we open the 13th chapter of the book of Joshua, one of the things that we see at the very beginning is a reminder of the age of Joshua. He is not a young man. In fact, twice we're told he is old, advanced in years. This is similar, of course, to Moses, whom the Lord did not call to his public ministry until he was 80 years old. It was when, after he had spent 40 years in the land out of Egypt, after he had killed the Egyptian soldier, that the Lord called him out of Midian and told him to go back into Egypt and bring the people out of bondage. Joshua had been a, a young man when they had left the uh, uh, the, the cities of Egypt and had progressed on into the wilderness. So it was at least 40 years as the men and women strove with God in the land of, uh, of, 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 of the wilderness. And as they went through the wilderness, you know, this young man became an old man. And now he engaged in a year or so of fighting in the land. But God is not done with Joshua. And one of the things that he tells him here is that there is much more to do for the kingdom. There is more land to conquer. There are more tribes to conquer. And the work that God had begun at Jericho, 
had much more to accomplish. Now, one of the immediate applications that we can take from this passage is for elder saints. It's worthwhile to remember that the Lord's work in his people is never done. There is no time where we retire from being the saints of the Lord. One of the things that I often hear from older saints as I visit with them is they wonder about what exactly the Lord is keeping them here for. One of the things that we see here in the witness of Joshua is the fact that the Lord has a purpose for every Christian under heaven. We may not all be called to uh, act, be active in warfare uh, like Moses was at his advanced age or with what we see here with Joshua. So what can an older saint do today? You know, the most powerful thing that an older saint can do is pray for the Lord's people. One of the things that God has done in uh, their older age has uh, taken away a little bit of their mobility, their opportunities to go outside the home. And of course, when the world looks at that, uh, they uh, see again the taking away of life, of uh, a blessing, of all of these things that the world counts as good. But for the Christian, what we see is the Lord making more time available, not just for prayer, but for the hearing of the word and for the time in which we can provide wisdom unto the younger people. In fact, this is one of the things that uh, Paul will tell young Timothy in his pastoral letters that there is to be a role kept of the widows. And one of the things he says there is that he's not to enroll anyone under the age of 60. Now, in the days of Paul and Timothy, 60 was quite elderly. The life expectancy in those days was around 40 years old. So to make it to that age was, again, uh, something of an accomplishment. And so the Lord, there in the days of Timothy and Paul, just as much here in the days of Joshua, is reminding us, again, that the Lord always has a purpose for his covenant people. And so when we are providing wisdom, for instance, to the younger uh, folks, we have a wealth of that to provide. And of course, the younger people should be encouraged to go and to hear the wisdom of the aged. Now, the prophet Isaiah, as he is speaking of the work that is going to come of the suffering servant, encourages not just the elderly, but all men to think of, again, the work that the Lord has for them. In Isaiah 46, 4, he says, even to your old age, I am he. And even to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. It's one of the things that, you know, if you are of that uh, age group that you can be praying for, is that, again, to remind yourself that the Lord has made you, that the Lord will bear you up in this season of life, that the Lord will carry you through this and the Lord will deliver you in the midst of these things. Again, there is no time where we are of no use to the Lord. And again, this is why God in his wisdom has revealed this to Joshua here at the beginning of Joshua 13. Now, another thing that we see happening here is an expansion of the reminder of the promises of the Lord unto God's covenant people. Many, many years before this, while the people of God were in the land of, uh, of, of the wilderness, God had made promises unto his people about where they would be in the days after the conquest. The borders of the tribes had already been established by the Lord. And here we see God in his mercy reminding the people that though there was still much to do, that the Lord had not forgotten his promise to Israel. That the land had been promised to the nine tribes and a half of Manasseh, 
would come to pass. They would receive these things. Again, sometimes in the Christian life, we can come to a point where we wonder whether it's all worth it. Whether everything that we've been through, everything that we've dealt with, is it worth it? the blessings that are to come, especially if we're not experiencing those blessings at the moment. The Apostle Paul, as he writes in the book of Hebrews, reminds us in Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And this is the exact picture that the Lord is painting for his covenant people as they continue to battle against the tribes in the land. You can rest assured that whether they are of the tribe of Judah or of Simeon or of Manasseh or of Gad or of Asher, that they are tired. They're worn out from this campaign season. And so they need an opportunity to renew their thanksgiving to the Lord for the land that he's given to them and for the world that he is Provided. It's interesting again that Paul here in Hebrews 10, after he speaks of the confession of our hope uh, that, that, that we are to not waver, that in the next couple of verses he speaks of the importance of worship on the Lord's day. One of the things we do and one of the reasons we need to be in worship every Lord's day is because we need to be refreshed. We need to be reminded of God's covenant promise. We need to be reminded regularly of the nature of what we have received in Jesus Christ. As, as the people are going through the wilderness and as they're going through these battles, they've been given signs and seals of the covenant of grace. They've been given opportunity to gather around the tabernacle, to gather around with the Levites, that's not, again, the full picture, is it? It would still be many years until a permanent temple would be made for the, uh, for the place of God's resting. And yet God, again, is faithful unto them, and he continues to show them this faithfulness throughout their wanderings in the land. Now, look with me there in verse 6 as we see part of this promise laid out. In verse 6, it says, All the inhabitants of the mountains from Lebanon as far as the brook Mizraphoth and all the Sidonians, them I will drive out from before the children of Israel. Notice again the reminder, who is doing the work? It is not the Israelites. Sure, they're the ones on the ground you know, with the javelins and spears and, and bows and arrows and chariots, but it is the Lord that is accomplishing these things. And again, the reason why God in his mercy brings this to bear once more into the ears and hearts and minds of God's people is because it's very easy for us to forget that it's the Lord that accomplishes these things. It is the Lord that not only carries us through, but it is the Lord that will give us the victory. Often, as we've gone through these uh, battles in the book of Joshua, we have uh, made the comparison between what's going on with Joshua and the tribes and our own fight against sin. It may seem at times that our fight against sin is never ending. And there's a sense in which that is true. We always will be fighting against sin, no man, matter if we are a baby in the womb or if we are 120 years old. Because as long as we are in this mortal body, we will have to fight against that old man. Now, there is a place for the reality that the more we fight, the more we see, the more grace we receive, the less arduous the battle may become. But that doesn't mean the battle goes away. Here we see the people of God engaging in these battles against all of the, A the Avites and Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Amorites and the Gebelites and all the other ites in the land. Again, they have to be discouraged in some way. They have to be uh, tired of continuing to fight these battles. But as long as they remember that these are the Lord's battles they are fighting, then they will receive, again, the fullness 
of his grace and the fullness of his strength as they continue to engage in these things. Because again, what is the God of the Sidonians versus the God of Israel? Of course, he is nothing in comparison to Jehovah. He's nothing in comparison to the God who created the heavens and the earth. Now, notice something else that we see happening here. After we are told of the, uh, the, the fact that it is the Lord that is driving out the children of Israel, we are told that then they will divide it by lot to Israel as an inheritance. Now, this is another important word to remember. And this is a word that has really lost its meaning in our day. How many young people do you think nowadays make decisions based upon what's going to benefit their grandchildren? think the, the numbers are probably quite small. And why is that? Because we have forgotten as a society, as a country, that we have inherited quite a bit. And then it's our responsibility to nurture and care for that inheritance so that it's available to pass on to our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And the people of Israel have to remember that the land is an inheritance from Abraham. The land is not a new thing in the plan of the Lord. Remember, it was the land that God had promised to Abram as he called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. And as God has called him out of Ur of the Chaldees and given him the land, the promise has been to God's people while they were in Egypt and throughout the wilderness and through these days and the days of Joshua, that they are receiving what God has already promised to his people. And that's again why it's so vital for the church today to remind not only the aged, but the young and all in between, that they have a great responsibility to make sure that the children are raised up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, that they are reminded of God's covenant promises that were made to Abraham, that they applied to them, and that they, again, will have that responsibility when they grow up to teach that to their children. This is the great covenantal blessing. It's one of the reasons why we baptize infants, because we believe, again, that they are inheritors of the promises made to Abraham because they are members of the covenant family. So again, as we see here in Joshua 13, the fact that the lots of the land in the, the, the place of Palestine is being given as an inheritance, we also are told here, beginning there in verse 8, that not only will the half-tribe of Manasseh get their land, but all of the others who had asked Joshua back way at the beginning of this chapter, that they could stay on the east side of the Jordan, that they would also receive their reward because they had remained faithful to God and they had stayed with their brothers and sisters as they fought the tribes in the land. And because of their faithfulness, God was going to keep his promise to them. So we see here again the nature of something that Paul brings up in the book of Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And that's one of the great comforts and assurances we have as believers. Just as the tribes of Israel in these days had the assurance of God's promise that they would receive the land that God had set aside for them, we have the assurance that the eternal land of promise, the heavenly places where the Lord Jesus Christ dwells, will be our home for eternity. And again, why are we confident of this very thing? Because he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And when the day that the Lord Jesus Christ returns uh, for the second time. And this is what motivates us, again, not only to holiness, but to make sure that we are reminding our young children about the inheritance that they have received so that they pass that inheritance on to our great-grandchildren and great-great-great-children in the Lord. It's one of the things that the psalmist brings up as he's encouraging uh, the men and women of his day, 
to, be, again, be obedient to Jehovah. That they are to pray for their great-grandchildren. They're to pray that the great-grandchildren are to be found in the Lord. Because this is the hope of every generation, that it passes itself on, not only in name, but in spirit and through the faith that we've received from above. Now, as we continue here, let's go ahead and turn there to verse 15. As we go to the end of the chapter, in verse 15, it says, And Moses had given to the tribe of the children of Reuben an inheritance according to their families. Their territory was Maror, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, in the city uh, that is in the midst of the ravine, and all the plain uh, by Medeba, Heshbon, and all its cities that are in the plain, Debon, Bamoth, Baal, Beth, Baal, Mion, Jehazah, Ketamoth, Mephath, Kirjathane, Sibmas, Zareth, Shehar, on the mountains of the valley, Beth Peor, the slopes of Pisgah, and Beth Jeshemoth, all the cities of the plain, and all the kingdoms of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon whom Moses had struck with the princes of Midian, Ebi, Rechem, Zer, Hur, and Reba, who were princes of Sihon, dwelling in the country. The children of Israel also killed with the sword, Balaam, the son of Baor, the soothsayer, among those who were killed by them. And the border of the children of Reuben was by the bank of the Jordan. This was the inheritance of the children of Reuben, according to their families, the cities, and their villages. Now, one of the questions that sometimes comes up here in Joshua 13, as well as in this whole portion of the book of Joshua, is why does Joshua feel the need to repeat all the names of these kings and towns that they had destroyed? Wouldn't the people know who they were and who had been there before? And one of the things that you can do is you can go to the a courthouse and you can go back in the records and find out who has owned your land uh, way back uh, you know, into the 18th century when King George gave it to whomever he gave it to originally. And you can see how it's been passed on, you know, whether it's still in the same family as it is the case here at Bethany for quite a number of you. But again, you can see. And, and what's the benefit of that? Well, again, for some of you, you can see that unbroken promise. You can see that inheritance that you have received. But also, if there is a problem on the land and you find something on the land or, or whatever, then you know who to contact, you know, to get in, in touch with. Well, one of the reasons why this is repeated is that the people of God need to remember the victories that the Lord has given to them. As they are sitting in their home that used to belong to a Heshbon, then they are comforted and reminded that it's the Lord that has given them that land. It's the Lord that has provided them that place of refuge, that place in which they can have peace. And this is part of the reason why it's so important for us to be regular in our own renewal of our covenant with the Lord. You know, why we are to be constant in our remembrance of our thanksgivings unto God's goodness to us. We think when we come to the Lord's table, that's one of the things that we're doing at the table. We're not just renewing the covenant with the Lord, but we are remembering his sacrifice on our behalf. In many ways, we are transported to Golgotha when we come to the table. And we think upon not only the pain and anguish of the Lord, but of course, we're reminded of the love of the Lord our God as we eat his flesh and drink his blood, and as we are refreshed in his grace. So again, as he is writing all these things, we see there in verse 24, Moses also had given an inheritance to the tribe of Gad, to the children of Gad, according to their families. Their territory was Jazer and all the cities of Gilead, and half the land of the Ammonites as far as Aror, which is before Rabbah, and from Heshbon to Ramath Mitzpah, and Betanim, and from Mahanaim to the border of Deborah. In the valley of Beth Haram, Beth Nimrah, Sukkoth, and Zaphon, the rest of the kingdom of Sihon, king of Heshbon, with the Jordan at its border. As far as the edge of the Sea of Chinneroth, on the other side of the Jordan eastward, this is the inheritance of children of Gad, according to their families, the cities, and their villages. Moses also had given inheritance to the half-tribe of Manasseh. It was for half the tribe of the children of Manasseh, according to the families. Their territories from Mahanaim, all Bashan, all the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, and all the towns of Jair, which are in Bashan, 60 cities, half of Gilead and Ashtaroth and Edrod, cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan, were for the children of Maker, the son of Manasseh, for half the children of Maker, according to their families. 
These are the areas which Moses had distributed as an inheritance in the plains of Moab on the other side of the Jordan by Jericho eastward. To the tribe of Levi, Moses had given no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance as he has said to them. Amen. Here we close in chapter 13 with a second time being told about the lack of inheritance of Levi. Now Levi, of course, was set aside by Jehovah to be the priests of the land. And every tribe was called to give a tenth of their annual gross to the Levites for their maintenance so that they had somewhere to live, they had food, and they were provided for. Because the Levites and the priests have been given a unique responsibility amongst all the tribes. And that was to be the mediator between God and man. They were to oversee the worship of the Lord. They were to take care of the sacrifices. And they were to teach the people of the blessings of God. And again, it's important to see here why it is God has not given them a land in which to dwell. Because their inheritance is, as it says here, from the Lord. The Lord has provided for them. This is somewhat similar to what we see, for instance, in Acts chapter 6. We talked about that this morning in Sabbath school. How in Acts chapter 6, we have the division between the elders and the deacons. Why are the deacons created in Acts chapter 6? So that the, the ministers, the elders are free to preach the gospel. They're not taken up with the matters of the house, so to speak. And again, that's because, not because one is necessarily more vital than the other, but because some have been set apart for that purpose. And traditionally, that's why churches provided manses for ministers. Was not only that it made it easier to get rid of them because they didn't have to sell a house and all that kind of stuff, but so that they need not worry about the things of this world so that they were freed up from those entanglements so that they could work for the kingdom of God. That's again one of the reasons why Paul will commend to Timothy that he be uh, taken care of by the church there at Ephesus, that, that, that he be allowed to take advantage of the grain that he is treading. So again, we see here in Joshua 13 quite a number of pictures that point us forward to what's going to take place in the new covenant and the way that the world is going to operate in the church in those days. It's one of the reasons why it's so important for us to spend time in the Old Testament because we learn so much that God not only has not changed, but that God has always been the one at the forefront of taking care of his people. Whether it was in these days of Joshua as he led them through victory over the enemies in the land, or whether it's in our own day as the Lord continues to lead us in victory over sin and victory over death through the Lord Jesus Christ. Our great hope and our great peace is in this inheritance that we have not won, but have received through the blood and life, death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let us I hear from David in 1 Kings 8:56, or Solomon from 1 Kings 8:56. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised to his servant Moses. Again, we know that to be true because of what we have seen the Lord do from generation to generation. He has been faithful to his promise. He will be faithful forever and ever. Because he is the Lord, our God. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for the time you've given to us to study your word and think through these uh, uh, pictures and images and historical realities that our forefathers in the faith went through as they uh, gathered the land to themselves. And you have set aside again this blessing unto your people that we might receive again once more a remembrance of the inheritance, one, by the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.